Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so first of all, thanks for having me here. So hi, everyone. My name is Siji, and I also go by Anna. I'm a grad student um, at UC Irvine working with James Bullock. And um, also, I'm also working with Andrew Wetzel, Robin Sanderson, and Andrew Grouse, and also all the FIRE collaborations. So our work is mainly using um, the fire, the using the simulations to study the evolution of the um, stellar halo of the Milky Way-like systems. So our focus is on the stellar halo. The standard picture of how the stellar halo form is that it's accreted. Um, it's formed by different accretion disruption events, and a lot of people have already looked into this. For example, Bullock and Johnson model, they did a great job reproducing the observed um, substructures in a real Milky Way, um, like this. So, but today in my talk, I'm going to talk about how in a latte fire simulation we find, actually find another component in a stellar halo that actually comes from stars that were born in outflows. And by the way, there is already evidence showing that stars do form in those outflows from this work. And also they're even finding that the star formation is very popular among the outflows that they've studied. So first of all, the simulations that we were using um, is the Fire 2 Latte Suite, which is a set of cosmological zoom-in simulation um, using the new Fire 2 model. So you can read about all the details on the feedback model here on this one paper. So I'm just going to skip it here. So um, the Latte Suite has really high resolution. The mass resolution of it. 7,000 solar mass and gas resolution adapts all the way down to one parsec. And star formation only happens in the, self in the dense self-gravitating molecular clouds, relatively high density threshold, at least for a cosmological simulation, of 1,000 particles per centimeter cube. And here on the right hand side is just a gallery of some of the visualization of some of the runs in the Latte Suite. So we are looking at the stars in an outer stellar halo in this galaxy. So what we've done is that we track their birth or formation radii of these stars and compare them to their current radii. And this is what we got. Here is the plot. And this blue line. Uh, let's see if I can. Oh, sorry. Th this black line is the one to one line here. And the stars in this region basically stay where they were born. So it's like the disk region or the heated disk region, because as you can see, it kind of smeared out to left and right of this one to one line for a little bit. And the accreted part of the stellar halo that is here. So they were born really far out, um, like 200, even 300 um, kiloparsec from the center of the galaxy, but are now inside our galaxy. Um, they make this kind of horizontal band that extends all the way to the left of this one to one line. But what is new is this part. So this is the stuff that, um, that are born at really small radii, smaller than 10 kiloparsec, but are now really far out. For example, 200 over 300 kiloparsec. So how do they get there? All right, so first of all, let's quantify our contribution here. So um, this here we're showing the density profile for the outer stellar halo outside, say, 20 kiloparsec. Um, and if we only look at this part, the stars with burst radius smaller than 10 kiloparsec, we have this blue line here. And now let's just do a simple math by assuming that the fraction of the in-situ star as the ratio of the two density at different radii, and we get this one. So as you can see, it's a pretty decent amount of contribution, especially at large radius. It can go all the way up to 20 or even 30 percent. 
All right, so now let's um, look at this two population here in an outer stellar halo. Um, so the magenta one represent the stars born within 10 kiloparsec, and by our, def by our assumption, it's the in situ part. And also, the cyan ones represent the stars that are born outside 200 kiloparsec from the center of the galaxy, and there are almost definitely accreted stuff here. And this is the distribution of the radial velocity for the two population. So here, these two lines are showing the distribution of their current radial velocity. And this two field block here are showing the distribution of their radial velocity when those stars formed. So as you can see, um, the current distribution looks pretty similar. And, but the distribution for their burst radial velocity are very, very different. Here, this magenta block is actually telling us that those stars that form in the center of the galaxy, they were formed with very uh, high positive radial velocity, which means when they were born, they were moving away from the center of the galaxy at that time with really high speed. So we came up with the hypothesis that those stars are actually formed in outflows. And it happens in all of the rounds that we are studying. So this is the um, fraction of the in-situ um, stars for all the um, rounds that we've an analysis, analyzed, and they're color-coded by the stellar mass of the host galaxy. So now here I'm going to show you how this event really happens. So I'm focusing on this one event, and you'll just see it. So on the left-hand side is the mock starlight movie, and on the right-hand side is the distribution of gas color-coded by um, the temperature of the gas. So here in the mock starlight movie, we're seeing a stellar outflow event happening. And in this gas movie, we're seeing a super bubble being generated here. So our hypothesis here is that some clustered feedback events in fire, for example, supernova explosion, it happened to drive um, um, it happened to drive outflows of um, the compressed shells of high density gas, and as it get compressed, that triggers the star formation. So stars would form with really high uh, radial velocity. They will be moving away from the center of the galaxy and forming this kind of streams that we see here. And uh, let's take a closer look at it. So we zoom into this 10 kiloparsec box. Here, we're showing some of the snapshot right around the time when that crazy event in a previous movie happens. And also, we are adding some new information here with star formation rate density highlight in pink. So basically, the pink areas here are forming a lot of stars. So if you look at the specific, oops, specific areas, so we are actually seeing that the edges of these bubbles have, has really high star formation rate. And as the bubble expands, this high star formation rate region develops along with the front of this bubble. So we see that star formation works to both drive outflows and generating new outflowing stars at the edges of this expanding bubbles. All right, so let's also take a look at the gas particles. So, um, um, so in a top panel, so this is in a slightly different viewing angle. So in the top panel, we're showing the gas particles color-coded by their radial velocities. So basically, the red particles are moving away from the center of the galaxy with high speed, and the blue or the purple ones are falling back. And in the middle panel, we're showing the gas surface density here. The yellower the region, basically the denser the, molecular, the gas cloud. And in the bottom panel, we're showing the newly formed stars. So basically, those are the stars formed in between the two snapshots. So comparing the top and middle panel, we can see those red points. They are compressing on this dense gas region, which is the yellow ones in the middle panel. Um, 
So they're driving, they're, they're compressing this um, dense gas fusion and creating those bubbles that we see in the previous, previous movie. And also stars are forming in this compressed gas. And because, um, because this compressed gas, they, ha they have already been accelerated, so those gas in the bottom panel, as we can see when they form, they are moving away from the galaxy really fast. Um, so this stellar outflow events, they would develop with those cold gas outflows, and it looks like that those stars are launched from the galaxy and forming those kind of streams at the edges of those bubbles. So this is our picture of how this event happens, if I have convinced you. So we've also looked at some of their um, observable properties for those stars born within 10 kiloparsec. So for example, here I'm showing a space and spatial distribution for the two populations for comparison. So first of all, in the top panel, we are showing the phase space distribution, and they're color-coded by the stellar ages. And in the bottom panel, we're showing the phase on projection of the spatial distribution of the two population and color-coded by the metallicity of the stars. As you can see here, compared with the accretive stuff, the in-situ stars are more evenly distributed, and we don't see a lot obvious clumpiness or substructures here. And also, if you look at the bottom panel, you may have already noticed that there is a color difference here between the two population. So we've also looked at their chemical abundances here. So this is the kernel density estimate of the two population um, in this metallicity versus magnesium over iron plot. As you can see, the in situ stars, this red clump here, this two population, they actually separate beautifully here in this one plot. The in situ population, they're compared to the accreted one, they are more metal rich and they are more alpha enhanced as they form a more massive progenitor and in deeper potential wells. So, um, yeah. So here is my summary. If I've convinced you about it, then um, the first one is that. In a fire simulation, cluster supernova feedback events happens to drive outflows of compressed shells of high density gas, and inside those gas clouds, there is star formation. So stars would form with really high initial velocities and travel ballistically outward and eventually fall back in a halo because of um, the interaction with the potential of the host galaxy. And if you don't believe this is true, then our conclusion is that um, there is an issue population which contributes to the stellar halo, and the fraction can go up to 20 or even 30 percent in the outer stellar halo of our simulations. And they are really different in some observable properties compared to the accreted stuff, like they are more metal rich and they are more alpha enhanced, but they show no obvious signals of clumpiness or substructures. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Here you go. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Sujit? Yes. Oh, or this one? Yes, there are, um, several, there are a lot of different outflow events in a history. So it's not just because of the one that I show in a visualization. Yeah. Uh, any junior people? Yes, go ahead. Uh, 
Um, no, we actually we didn't look at those stuff because when we are looking at um, the outer stellar halo with those stuff um, that were born in the center of the galaxy, we also we look at we check the radio velocity. So most of their radio velocity are really really their burst radial velocity are really, really high, which means when they were born, they were already like moving that fast. It's not like um, after they form and some like um, accretion event happen, br uh, bring those stars out, so. Okay, let's take one more question, Mauro. Yeah, so um, I guess we can. Uh, we haven't really tried yet because currently we're looking at the outer stellar halo. Those are like really far out, say like outside 50 kiloparsec. And we don't have a lot of samples in Gaia to... But they are very eccentric out of four so Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think I think I think also the one point is that after a long time of a, after a long time of like evolution in the um, center galaxy, the velocity of those stars is not like is not that high. Like after. Uh, all right. Let's formed, um, yes. Let's continue this interesting discussion during the coffee break. Um, but before, thank you.